you know who they are. And we have to move into the public space where ordinary citizens are and not just have a rhetorical or clear, pure sort of ideological or political perspective about this. So we have to be patient with people as well. When they raise objective issues of the critique of a, a president, uh, in the case Maduro, and we know that to be objectively true, it's not a concession to say, Yes, people in Venezuela are raising that, and not all of them are the right-wing opposition. That's for them to determine how they will mediate and whether he is the best steward for carrying forth these policies. Uh, I am hearing our voices, and I'm feeling our weight of engagement and um, of, of petitioning of governance. I'm feeling us moving more and more into the public space with all of the other citizens and less and less on the margin that somehow we got the gospel and if only they could understand what we understand. So I think that is our that is our learning task in maturing ourselves and how to engage with our fellow citizens in the political spectrum who are earnest. There are dogmatic right wingers who are not going to have but the majority of people, if we bring the power of information and the power of orientation about how democracy, meaning driven by citizens, can unfold, I think we can build a momentum not only on the question of Venezuela, but on a whole series of other domestic and international questions, as we are seeing in the case, again, of dealing with the Israeli government apartheid. We are in a flow. Uh, we are in a place that we have never been in my 72 years. And we just have to keep doing that work. Great. Um, and just to follow up uh, with some points that were really great that James made, um, you know, failure is a necessary part of a, of a revolutionary process. Political projects can and will fail, but that failure doesn't mean it's a dead end. Failure is deeply necessary for the health of any revolutionary process. It's really important to learning. And so when people point to failures of a revolution or, or Environment revolution in this, in this instance, it's okay because the people are leading a self determined struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I totally agree and uh, totally think that we should keep that in mind as we hear that there's a nuance between a violent right wing opposition that's you know working with a neoliberal agenda or people who are pushing the Bolivar process further left. Um, so, I'd like to invite. Um, uh, Another audience member to ask a question. Um, if you're able to, could you um, please come up to the mic? Thank you. Thank you for hosting this event. Uh, first of all, I want to express my disagreement with everything that's being said today. Uh, I'm, I don't know how many here are Venezuelan and how many are experts on the Venezuelan constitution. Okay, so do you happen to work for the Venezuelan government by any chance? Okay, so we talked about democracy. You know, democracy is more than just elections. Mm -hmm. Democracy means institutions, means the ability of people to face power without the fear of a consequence from that power. Yeah, yeah. I think we can all agree on that. The thing is that that's not real in Venezuela. There's a reason why 4 million Venezuelans, and that's not a made up number, that's not fake, 4 million Venezuelans had to flee the country. And it's not just because of hunger, it's because the Maduro regime is an oppressive regime. You spoke of a violent opposition. Have you seen what the Venezuelan government, what the Maduro regime has been doing in the slums of Caracas in the last couple of days? Do you know what the FAES is? The FAES is the Venezuelan police special forces, and they've gone into the barrios the slums of Caracas, and they're killing people deliberately and without any consideration. They're killing poor people. This is not, you know, the elites complaining now. Have you seen the demonstrations happening in Venezuela? Do you yes. know what? Yes. The, in the poor regions. Yeah. And I, I just want yeah. to. Yeah. Got it. I just want to ask you. In the interest of I, I just want to ask you. I want to ask you. You know. Do you think that the Venezuelan people are really better off in the hands of a regime that wants to kill them, to remain in power, and to maintain their economic That's your strength? Question. That's your question. Um, first of all, even the 
conservative, mainstream, and right-wing press in the United States have not put forth any statement like that, that people are being killed in the slums. So you got to bring evidence. That's one. Secondly, this notion of, this abstract notion of the American people, the Uruguayan people, the Venezuelan people, uh, six million people voted for this guy to be president, whether I like it or you like it or not. There are millions, uh, uh, thousands of people in the street in support uh, of Maduro and the Bolivarian principles. They too are of the Venezuelan people. So this is an objectification that there is a real deep, intense, sometimes ugly divide going on among different sectors who make up the Venezuelan citizens. So this abstraction that this is in the interest of Venezuelan people is, is just that. And finally, a rhetorical question to you. Is it democratic that the United States government, a sector of the United States government, will make a decision of who should lead the Venezuelan nation? That is as anti-democratic as it comes. So, so given this deep divide ideologically and politically among various sectors of the Venezuelan citizenry, mediation is the way to try to figure this out. But let's also be clear that mediation is not even-handed. Somebody has state power. That is a fact. And they have state power because since 1999, they have been consistently voted in by the majority of Venezuela instead of that ideological outlook and that policy direction. And so what they have in common of sustaining a stable country and being able to have a process in which they can continue to debate and struggle over the ideological and political of the direction of the country peacefully is the democratic issue. It is not Donald Trump. It is not Bolton, the most anti-democratic fascist, or Elliot Abrams. And this is what Guaido needs to stand up and say, listen, I do not want invasion in my country. He he won't yeah, he was just in the White House, yeah, they were just in the White House Tuesday. Yeah. He said it repeatedly. Yeah. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Let's Let's okay, go ahead. I just want to say something. Uh, because um, just about every visit that I've made to Venezuela, I made a point to go to Barbara Venture. Barbara Venture was on the coast, was about 75 kilometers from Caracas. And it's where a large portion of African descendants live. My first visit to Venezuela in January 2004 was to talk about the issues of Afro-descendants. We had been invited by Chicho Garcia, who was led being the leader of the 29 Afro-descendant organizations, Venezuela Afro-descendant organizations. The real truth of what is happening with the Bolivarian Revolution happens in our Barlamento. I don't know if you've ever been to Barlamento, and I don't know if you've talked to the people, African-descendants in Barlamento, uh, uh, I don't know if you've been to the places that I've been in the barrios where I saw on first hand Cuban doctors living there, medicine, health care, baby people in those communities. I don't know if you you've been able to do that. When I when I when I've gone to places, it's not to sit particularly with Google Child there or anybody else. When I'm going to places, I just go to talk to people and to see what impact they have, that what the changes have had on their direct lives. And I said the last time I was in Venezuela as on assignment as the Google ambassador for the decade of African descendants in Caracas, I went to Bolivento. And again, you see the same kind of celebration and the game kind of identity that they have with the changes that have, the real changes that affect their, their lives. What we're talking about, we're not we're talking not about just hyperbola. We're talking about the UN's uh, reports on uh, uh, on 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 the, the you know the extreme extreme, extreme cases of of, of, uh, of poverty and and all the things that have happened in that in real in two terms those are the things I saw of course is predicated on the, the high price of oil and that those resources those resources public resources were distributed to programs that impact people's life there's no doubt about that 
but it's a, it's it's that which has been on the on the attack from the beginning. That has been on the attack from the very beginning, and nobody wants to acknowledge that. So it is the real agenda to kill those programs that really affect people. You and you and has already said that one the sanctions are illegal. That is affecting health care, affecting medicine, procurement, and everything else within as well. That's real. That's real. Whatever we may want to say about about Maduro, and and whatever we want to say about what is what is happening, those things really happen at some point in this Venezuelan history, and and that that change and whatever happened when from 1999 was objective and was real, and and said certainly it gave us and not only gave gave uh, uh, Venezuelans another Spanish point to look at their world, also gave the rest of the, 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 the continent as well, Latin America as well. So I don't know, in, in that sense, you, you, you're, you're, putting, you're putting out some, a, lot of, a lot of information about here, about people being killed in the barrio. You know? I, 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 I don't know if you've ever been to a barrio. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you've ever been to a barrio. I went to school you, can walk, you can walk in here, as you are right now, to a barrio and make that statement. And say what you said. Have you ever been to a barrio? I was so I'm not going to argue about that, but I know what we went and what I saw in the sense in people's lives and the effect it had on people's lives. And, and just quickly, and yes, notwithstanding the fact that the United States is trying to strangle the economy and cripple uh, the government's ability to provide food and health, a government has a responsibility to provide food and health, and they have to figure it out, and they cannot be let off the hook by saying, well, U.S. imperialism has done this, because they've done it through of this region, and they will continue to do it, and governments have to figure out how to do it. So it is the responsibility. We do know for a fact that the violent right-wing members of the opposition, and that's not all of the opposition, burned a number of black Brazilians. You know, we have to talk about that. Uh, and we also know that no one in the United States government, by and large, in the neighboring country, talked about the six million people displaced under the, under, under the, under the Colombian government, you know, uh, over 50 percent of them Afro-Colombians. Yeah. So, you know, if, if we're going to talk about institutions and democracy, let's not talk ideology. Let's talk about how we negotiate with policies that people can participate in changing their lives. But yes, the government has to figure out a way in which they're going to stop this out with flow of migration and provide them the fact that these people are trying to strangle them. And that's all Venezuelans they're trying to strangle because they want members of the opposition to move violently in the overthrow. And so they will starve them as well. Yes. Thank you, James and Danny. I have another question from the audience from my guess is Dr. Freeman. Um, thank you. I'm actually not saying this on behalf of the Institute for Policy Studies. I'm here representing the Black Alliance for Peace, um, in which I'm on the coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace. And we put out statements on Venezuela, a number of things, and, and we want to point to this copies out there, why we oppose the U.S. intervention in Venezuela. And then, you know, I just heard a number of things, and very quickly, quickly, I think one of the things that this situation points to is it has it should have particular significance for people of African descent in the United States. It would be outright foolish for us to support this intervention and the interest here when we're facing the kind of things that we're facing in this country by this government and even around the world. I mean, what they're doing in Venezuela is no different than what they're trying to do in the Congo, and they just like even when they assassinated Patrice Lumumba, but just recently are trying to make sure that their interest in terms of who's in the lead in the Congo. When people are talking about the people dying in Venezuela, and that's why they need the U.S. intervention, but we see what that what happens with U.S. intervention, the invasion of Panama, and what's happening in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya. You know, they, we, the list goes on and on what that brings. So they're not going in because they're they're uh, concerned with lives. Right here, we've seen as people of African descent the COINTELPRO operations of the FBI trying to overthrow our movements for justice here. Um, there's so many things. The 1033 program is militarizes the police to kill us with impunity in the United States. Yes. You know? And so they're voting on Black Lives Bill and all that, and then want to pretend that they're for Martin Luther King and, and, and peace and whatnot. And so 
there's a lot of contradictions here that we as African people, people of African descent, should be particularly acute to, and they're not fooled by the, the same interests of those who want to overthrow the Venezuelan government. Thank you. All right. So, um, the WPSW and WPSW and WBAI, my broadcast is going to finish. Um, I would like to thank both of those radio stations for joining us today. We are going to take a little break right now so that uh, we can wrap up with the uh, radio broadcast. But we'll go right back into questions. Uh, again, the plan is to finish at 7.30, uh, but we will welcome additional questions. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. But I just want to let you know that you just been trying to. Um, and I think uh, an interesting point that I would like that I what's that a speak? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, James, you said that you spent several hours uh, with Maduro. Could you please tell us what uh, you found? Was he sincere? Or what kind of person do you feel like he is? Uh, as Danny pointed out, uh, in 2004, I think it was um, we were in the, the Trans Africa Forum Board. Um, I was not a member of that board, but then he asked me to join me because I had experience in Venezuela. I uh, went to meet with the one that we also met with um, Maduro. So I've had a chance to observe him uh, and his governance as well. Uh, and I'm going to just a little broader context and answer your question quickly. Um, you know, Maduro, uh, uh, Chavez was called by the far right opposition monkey. And of course, uh, a concentrated response that he gave, I think it was on Democracy Now! at one of the UN meetings, he says, you see these big lips? You see this curly hair? That's Mother Africa. And I remember him saying to Danny in our first meeting when we went to have dinner with him, 15 Julianne Malvo, who was in WBFW, a number of other people. He had heard about us raising the issue of race uh, and the very racist perspectives uh, in Venezuelan society. And he said, you know, I am a mestizo of Spanish and Indian background, but my grandmother was black. Three months later, he's talking about Mother Africa and that he's an Afro descendant and a mestizo. And then he talked about policy. He said to Danny, he said, you know, we included everybody in the new constitution, senior citizens, indigenous people, but we did not include Afro descendants. And he turned to his policymakers and said, that's gotta be rectified. He opened a number of embassies in Africa. Of course, part of that is petro policy. Oh. Angola, places like that. But he sent black diplomats uh, to that. That's the context in which we first met Maduro. Hugo Chavez was an extraordinary organic intellectual who could take great philosophical ideas and turn them into very concrete organizational expressions. UNASUR, the community of Latin American and Caribbean nations, Petro Carib, he was an unusual states crafter by any comparison, literally anywhere in the world, including here in the United States. Maduro, who was his recommended successor, voted in by the Venezuelan people, is not Chavez. There are critiques inside his own party of his management abilities, issues of the economy, uh, but they will resolve that. That is the democratic process. And this is where patience and not calling on the United States government to invade the country, the people of Venezuela will struggle that out. And I think if we're able to prevent U.S. invasion and to tap down some of these economic sanctions, over the whole months, you're going to see willing members of the opposition engage Maduro about policy issues, and we'll see what his skill level is, and we'll see how he responds to the critiques within his own party. Uh, who say they support the Bolivarian Revolution, but they have raised specific uh, critiques. That would be uh, my observations uh, about Maduro, but we will see depending on how the Venezuelan people mediate this process. I will conclude by saying this, and I wish I had brought this quote because uh, I'm a student of Latin American and Caribbean history. That's my academic background. And I was looking at some quotes from Simon Bolivar, who talked about, and this is not just a question of Venezuela, this is a question of Bolivia. Uh, it's a question of Nicaragua. When one person is in power too long, and he didn't say what the terms of too long will be, 
you're going to run into problems. Look up that quote. Just put Simon Bolivar in quotes. And then I want you to think about the situation in Cuba. When Raul Castro became the president of Cuba, he proposed a law. He didn't step down that you could not be the president and senior figures in that government for more than two terms. And so when he rotated out his second term, they elected a new president. Uh, we will see how Venezuela handles this process going forward. We see with Evo Morales, who is running again. We see with Ortega. We, who are progressives and leftists and socialists, have to ask ourselves, can you concentrate on a single figure? Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders, a social Democrat and avowed social Democrat and running for the states last term, what did he say? It is not about you putting me in the White House. It's whether you're going to be 24-7 active citizens, leveraging whoever the steward to manage the aspirations that you have put forward. So even as we fight the roguish nature of the United States, the anti-democratic, the warmongering, the imperial situation in the United States, on the other side, those of us who are trying to construct new societies with fellow citizens, we have to question ourselves openly and not see that as redounding to the enemy of seeing here as an example. So Fidel Castro, before he died, he said, I have a request to the National Assembly. Would you please pass a law that you can name nothing after me because it was never about me. I don't want, my name should not be, people should not think that this revolution is concentrated in my individuality. Uh, we have to think in new creative ways about a protagonist participatory democracy, as they say in Latin America. Uh, and this is what some of these countries are struggling with. The thing that I think Maduro has also, there are some critiques within his own party about the communes have not been supported as much as they might have. Uh, I don't have all the details on that, but I do have that factual data that there is debate within their party of what is the most effective stewardship, the most effective management uh, through organizational expressions where citizens are at the center of gravity of that. And we'll see how Maduro and the colleagues in his party and those in civic organizations manage this process. But our responsibility is to be in solidarity, to give them the freedom, more latitude to do that without outside interference of someone trying to determine who will be the presidency, someone stealing the, the, the resources and the finances of the country. That's our responsibility. And now we should have our individual opinions, but we should not substitute that for what how Venezuelans mediate that across the ideological limit. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for your presentation. The agreement is about everything you said, except I'm a little bit less optimistic. Let us assume, as a matter of fact, I'm convinced of this, that there's not going to be mediation, there's not going to be negotiation because the, the process is too far along, and that they're going to push out and do it one way or the other. Maybe you will leave on his own on a plane. Hope not, but let's make that assumption. Why not use, as a practical matter, use this time and this, you'll have some power for the Bolivarian movement to position themselves for a future election where they might be relevant, maybe not Maduro himself, but someone from the movement, as opposed to waiting until the, the sky falls in and it's over completely and they're going to be marginalized, maybe even prosecuted. Um, so I'm wondering if, I know it's, it's a tactical issue, and you may not want to think about turn of events that forces this, but knowing what we know and seeing the, the, the trend, maybe some thinking ought to be done along that line. Um, listen, I don't think Maduro has any choice, but to hear the critiques within his own party, to hear the frustration and critiques among ordinary people who have supported for the last 20 years the Boulevard and Revolution, 
and to figure out whether he is the person who should be the steward for policies going forward or whether they should open a process of someone else. But that's something I'm not uh, pessimistic about that. The only thing that I'm yeah. really pessimistic about is that right-wing, anti-democratic fascists who violate international protocols of conflict resolution are trying to squeeze the process so that it cannot get organic development to have that kind of debate and negotiation and mediation. Maduro has reached out numerous times to the opposition. A process was started. The United States government intervened and said, stop it. They have threatened the Spanish government and others. Do not participate in this. Uh, they have declared that they can substitute themselves for all sections of the Venezuelan population and determine what should be the steward, who should be the stewardship, and what should be done with the natural resources. These people are very, very clear. They are not writing uh, two-page papers on this. They're giving us paragraphs. There's a troika, they say, mm -hmm. Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua. That's who we're going after. Maduro is illegitimate. We are going to determine legitimacy in Venezuela. And no, we're not going to have any discussions of any type. Yeah. Now, the Pope has said, if the opposition steps forward, I've already got one partner that I'm willing to work with. The Mexican government has stepped forward. There's a conference in Uruguay, I think this coming week, uh, that the Mexican government and the Uruguayan government are also trying to mediate. This is what we have to say to fellow citizens in the United States and fellow representatives in the US Congress. These are the vector points that you should engage, bringing whatever individual perspective you have about socialism, the Bolivarian Revolution, Nicolás Maduro, et cetera. But you should engage in helping to create that space where the Venezuelans themselves will figure this out. And I go back to and close on my term, respectful. The Bolivarian government of Nicolás Maduro cannot just enter into peaceful negotiations, they have to enter into respectful negotiations. When objective criticisms are being raised about this policy is not working or that policy is not working, they have to read that objectively, not ideologically. And they have to figure out how, and, and those are things, that's things like inflation, uh, in which there's a lot of critique in that party about what has was not done or what should have been done or when it should have been done. Those are legitimate questions for all citizens of the country, whether I like their ideology or political or not. That is something that affects the common welfare, uh, not just one ideological or uh, political perspective. So let's play our role, keeping outside interference so we can observe whether they play their role in respectful peaceful mediation uh, about where the country is going and particularly how its policies are operating in the interests uh, of, the, of the material life of its citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, I, how about, um, because it's our hand first, um, are able to ask a question and then you can answer. Thank you so much. Um, this may be a slight left turn, but as I listen to the behavior of the President of the United States, I'm reminded of the Carolina Constitution Convention, specifically the Articles of Incorporation, which say simply that if the President behaves amiss or betrays the public trust, he may be impeached. So my question is thus, has the President, maybe a left turn, in his behavior specifically regarding Venezuela, with him calling for the overthrow of the duly, legally elected representative of that nation, violate international law. I'm not clear about that, but from my perspective as a citizen of the United States, with him having made a pledge to protect the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, whether or not that simple thing has been violated. He betrayed the public trust 
and has he behaved in this? My question, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Simple answer is yes. Uh, the 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 most resonant case in point is uh, how do you pronounce his name? Ashogi. Yeah. So they don't deny that he was murdered, but they say it's secondary to our primary interest, and our primary interest is oil. Yes. And and, 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 and selling weapons, yeah. and so. Yes, they violated every basic ethical principle, um, every constitution, basic constitutional principle. These are dangerous, dangerous people. We, we need to be very, very clear uh, that these are people who take extraterritorial positions of saying, we will determine what the world banking system can do. We will determine what happens with your friends. But then also we have to ask ourselves, why are people staying in the Organization of American States? Mm. When the Cubans were invited back in, they said, no, thank you. We know where that leads to. Yeah. Now, the Venezuelans are in the process under the Maduro government of leaving. They took a protracted route rather than an immediate route of saying, today is the end of our participation. In the it's, you know, over the course of the next year, we will do it. Why do progressive governments put their money in post-colonial banks, and why are they having in the United States bank? Why did Citco put five hundred thousand dollars into the electoral? These are questions from the progressive and the left side. We have to ask ourselves simultaneously as we as we organize around the principal question, and that is keep the United States out of other people's business. But we can't say, well, after we resolve this, we will we will get to that. Uh, because our, those societies are suffering not only as a result of imperial intervention, but as Raul Castro said, this, this blockade is killing us. But if we remove it tomorrow, we may not be able to save our revolution because of our own errors and our own failures. That is a refreshing honesty among stewards of governance <coughs> that is a strength that empowers people to know that there is no paradise on earth, but there is progress if you face up to your own capacities and your own incapacities, and you continue to search in your population to find the people who can fit the moment. Cuba is an example. There is no Fidel Castro, the towering figure in Cuba. They've had three transitions of government, peaceful transitions. And if you read them every day, you will see the debates that they're having publicly inside their party, inside their government, inside sectors of their society, and saying that it is the citizen that is the key to democracy, not the representatives. That's a major maturation in their political culture, uh, one in which, uh, again, outside of Bernie Sanders in the last term, it's elect me, I'm a woman, elect me, uh, I'm black, elect me, uh, I'm transgender, like me, uh, I'm from the Midwest, uh, like me because I'm from this fraternity, I'm from this sorority. What are your policies? Mm -hmm. And so this is what Maduro has to be judged on of his policies. I think you have a question. Sure. Well, quick question, quick comment. Uh, my question, just very quickly building on uh, a thread you had earlier, is either of your analysis of the role of Venezuela taking up the CARICOM struggle for reparations for CARICOM's position now. But I also just briefly wanted to make a comment that I wanted to address the FICE issue directly, uh, you know, lest we be accused of ducking something. As an activist for the Movement for Black Lives, I follow this issue directly. Uh, and if you want to learn more yourself, I, I suggest you check out a report. which is closer, I believe the number I saw was 38 killed. Uh, but what you didn't report was that also in their investigation, there was conversation about the role of criminal gangs in instigating. So all that, just to say that vice is essentially a, a SWAT team-like mentality. And I think that there's two parts to that. I mean, I think one, you know, what is the sort of human rights approach when you are in countries like Venezuela or the United States or El Salvador, where you do have this entrenched history of, of intercommunal violence, community violence, international criminal networks, the way that could be politicized but how deeply it becomes rooted in a society. And this has been a, a critique that has been raised in certainly under the Workers' Party in Brazil and El Salvador, where they actually tried to put together a, a massive sort of peace process. 
process, not using the, uh, the police at all, but didn't get the results that many people in the population wanted. And I think even here in the United States, we've seen in Jackson, Mississippi, under Chokwe Lumumba, some of these contradictions emerge. And even ourselves here in the Stop Police Terror Project DC in Washington, trying to push non-police methods of dealing with community violence, also come against this issue that it's not just the community versus the police, but there's a contradiction inside of the community about how much police force should actually be used against those who are deemed criminals. And in the quote unquote progressive community in many countries, including this country, I also work a lot on housing. Every person I work with against gentrification, number one thing they talk to me about, crime, criminals, the front door is not locked. Uh, what's up with these young people? Why is everyone doing this? Young folks, the exact opposite. The police are always messing with us. Why is everyone out here? So there's all these different contradictions. And it's just very important for me that we don't use this issue of FICE or, or the, the much deeper police, police issues that exist in Brazil as a political football year. Because finally, just to close, and I'm sorry to say so much, but you know, from the point of view of institutions representing democracy, well, the police are an institution that kill a thousand people every year. They're disproportionately black. They face no accountability for that. I mean, in fact, the, in the, the reality of the State of the Union response address the Democrats is coming from someone who's actually challenging the legality of their own election because of things that were done there to suppress tens of thousands of black voters, three million over the country. So I would just suggest, I don't actually think the United States has the ability to judge what democratic institutions really are, to teach anyone else about them. And if there's anything else I think we can learn from Venezuela, it's that uh, democracy is actually about more than elections and more than so-called democratic institutions, like say the Electoral College, but it's about social, economic rights, equality, uh, and, and really extending the, the, the wealth of a nation to cover all people. And I think that's something that we can learn from Venezuela, but certainly uh, we have very little to learn from, from Donald Trump and Marco Rubio. So It continues to be. It is more than 200 years of existence now. It continues to be that question. Whose democracies is going to be? It's, as much as it was, it, it, and we had those great moments in, in, in our radical tradition, whether it was the populist movement at the end of the 19th century, or whether it's the movement of radicalism of the first part of the 20th century, and they brought about enormous victories and everything. But the question has always been, and continues to be, and it's, not, it's been endless. Whose democracy it is going to be? When we've seen other countries around the world, every one of us, and this men and women in this room have been involved in liberation movements from Africa to every part of the planet, you know what I'm saying? They talk about that. And the, the center of those little movements have been the right of people to make the same the choice, the people's choice. In every particular moment, those things have been undermined or undercut by the interests of, of the United States and at some point in time, the interests of colonial powers as well. So those are the questions that we have to still have to ask. That's at the bridge when we talk about this. Whether it's we, the policy, foreign policy is, is, is important to us to acknowledge and it's important for us to, to play a strategic part in as domestic policy. You can't separate the two. Yeah. On the reparations question, the Boulevard Revolution over the last 20 years has understood one thing that most people in this country and many people on the left in this country did not understand, that Hugo Chavez understood very, very well, and he was very deeply moved by it. Simon Boulevard led the first successful overthrow of Spanish colonialism in Latin America. Most people don't know mm -hmm. that Venezuela was the first to come forth. Simon Bolivar went to Haiti, this new independent country of former enslaved Africans who defeated France and said, I need help to defeat Spain. I need men and I need boats. Was it this name? No, 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 no. no. It's Andre Pichon. When we and guys, when we first met Chavez, we were, we were supposed to go to dinner. He said, "Let's let's have a talk." No paper. Chavez called the names of Haitian soldiers who died. This is the kind of mind he had. 
he called them by, he called several names out. He, he knew the specific sites about it. Bolivar went back, started a revolution, and was defeated. Where did he go? He went to Jamaica. Google it. The famous letter from Jamaica. What was Chavez's conclusion? We owe an eternal debt to Haiti. And I won't go into other stories where we've seen we were actually there when Haitians came to petition him and what he did about that. So he, on the reparations question, it's, it's, it boggles my mind. Maduro, in the last probably 14 months or so, in the middle of all this crisis, economic, political, and violence was going on, called an international meeting to put together a reparations commission for the descendants of enslaved Africans with lawyers and all. And there's another meeting coming up soon, mm -hmm. which was a continuation of the process of, of, of Chavez, uh, who in 2009, because it's 2009, he was not, he could not come to a final meeting and where he had accepted a proposal of a fund for Afro-descendant development because the only government fund that is hemisphere-wide comes out of the U.S. State Department. I won't go into the details. Those who are interested can contact me. And we, along uh, in collaborating with Afro-descendants in Venezuela and Afro-descendants in other places, said, you have a responsibility for your citizens to deal with their aspirations and not leave that to the National Endowment for Democracy or USAID, <laughs> uh, which the Cubans also missed this yeah. big problem in this. So saying, well, you know, we're not going to really talk about the issue of race. It's a splitting issue of race. Yeah. And the United States government says, in one chapter in transition to democracy in Cuba, we're going to talk about it. We're going to use racial divisions to overturn your revolution. We really don't have any interest in what the black people do. We will use them as an instrument. So. To Maduro's credit on that, and I just got a call week before last uh, from a very prominent lawyer saying, James, you, you think I should deal with this? Uh, and I said, they're still calling another meeting to take the next step in this in the middle of this crisis. So the reparations issue, and they have embraced the CARICOM countries, as has Cuba. All of the Caribbean governments uh, with numerous civil society operations from Rastafarians uh, to agriculturalists to atheists to socialists, uh, are organized as citizens across the Caribbean in collaboration with their government uh, on the reparations uh, for, with regard to the legacy of slavery. And that comes out in diabetes and other kinds of health issues. Uh, and they, some year, uh, I think uh, something like $100 million perhaps has just been added to the center in Jamaica. Some of the $200 million, I haven't the tendency they took. because some of the Nordic countries that we would not suspect that were involved in slavery have said, you know, we agree. We think we should take a look uh, about this, not just as a way of assuaging historical guilt, but as a way of dealing more equally with developed partners uh, and getting out of the subordinate level that many of them have been in. So the Maduro government has stepped forward on that. That does not answer the deeper political question, but it is a very important one because the issue of racism, including on the left in Latin America and including in Venezuela, is still a big problem. The white <laughs> blind spot. There is a romanticization of the indigenous question. It's an important democratic question. But in Venezuela, it's not either or. I mean, as Hugo Chavez said, we brought in everybody, but we did not bring in the black people. And my grandmother was black. You know that. that so there, is, that there have been revelations <laughs> from a humanistic perspective that have been turned in then to act, not just philosophy. Uh, we should conclude our task is to provide fellow citizens across the ideological and political perspective with as much empirical data as possible so that they can make the most informed decision. Our most insistent task is that it is not our right to intervene into the internal affairs and to determine how another country solves its own political crisis. And particularly going to our representatives, applauding those who have stepped forward to stop the sanctions, to stop military threats, to, uh, to stop uh, regime change. 
giving them more data and talking to others that they need to step up to the front, particularly the status quo elements of the Democratic Party, the Black Caucus, the Latino Caucus, the Progressive Caucus. That's our task uh, to go forth and do. Mm -hmm. I want to say thank you so much to Danny Glover and James Early for um, their taking the time to be with us today. Very uh, and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and our moderator.